How's it going, everyone? This is International Master Daniel Wrench. This is Chess.com's YouTube channel, and you know what this is. That's right. We took a break from the uh, openings train today. You know why? Because I need more cowbell. I got a prescription. I got a fever, and the only prescription is more cowbell. I mean live sessions. I need more live sessions, etc. Yeah, I really kind of messed up that reference, didn't I? It's tough when you make a Christopher Walken reference and you screw it up. In any case, uh, here I am actually playing a fellow international master on Chess.com's live server. This game should be rather exciting. It is a three-minute game with no increment. That means it's sudden death. Currently, I have two minutes and 41 seconds with my opponent having two minutes and 50 seconds. So I'm going to play fast and keep talking and keep this thing funky and keep it fresh. You know how we roll here. I'm developing into an English attack. This pawn chain supports attacking chances over on the king side, meaning the pawn on f3 supports g4, etc., uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, et cetera. But my opponent is taking an approach to postpone castling short. Normally, black is castled short at this point to try to reorganize his pieces to attack on the queen side. I'm expecting a move like queen a5 here at some point. He decides to play the move knight to b6 first. I'll slide over to f2 and hit that knight. Ask him exactly what he plans to do with his life with the queen and bishop battery. I'm going to happily give up this bishop and uh, then try to play against the uh, the weaknesses the weaknesses of the pawn on d6. I'm going to put the knight on d5. I'm aware that my g5 pawn is hanging. That's a little bit irritating, but the uh, move order here kind of escaped me probably because I was trying to make a Christopher Walken reference that I totally butchered. Uh, so... This structure, though typical and something I'm very familiar with, that being an English attack, this exact position is certainly not one that I'm that familiar with. He decides that he, he doesn't want to even go after that g5 pawn, which personally I think is a small mistake. I think he should have traded the g5 pawn for the uh, weak d6 pawn, as it's not going anywhere for a while on d6. Grab a Snickers. It's called a backward pawn, which means that I'm going to have a lot of time to gang up on it. F5 is a strong move, though. He's trying to create counterplay, aggressively create counterplay for that matter. And so he takes with the bishop, but I will probably be okay with giving up the h4 pawn for the d6 pawn, because after bishop takes h4, I can play queen e2 and attack the rook. And when he moves the rook back to c6, thinking he's defended everything, I'm going to play rook takes e5, taking advantage of the pin d6 pawn. Though in that case, actually, uh, <clears throat> I have to be a little bit careful, because if he takes it and I trade, he does get two rooks for the queen. So do I really want to go for that? I can also just play bishop to c5 and, and try to barrel, continue to barrel up on that pawn. Uh, I kind of like this move, bishop to c5. Takes advantage of the pin d6 pawn, and if he plays bishop to e7, maybe then I can take on e5. Really risky, though, because even if he takes it, I can take the queen, and then I'm getting my material back. But if I take e5 and he moves the queen somewhere over the rainbow, I will have to find safety for my rook and my bishop, which I'm not sure I can do in one move. So instead, I'm going to tuck my tail between my legs and retreat this bishop. Currently, I've lost a pawn, that being this h pawn, but I've got a lot of pressure against this weak d6 pawn, sort of in compensation, you might say. And he neglects the uh, the threat of this move, rook takes e5, because of the pin, one more move, and now I will take it. Not sure he saw this idea coming. Currently, I have a minute and 28 seconds with my opponent having a minute and 18 seconds, so I'm doing okay on time. We always love that, given that it's a live session, and at any moment I could... Uh, be under a critical amount of time pressure. I played c3 kind of instinctively, although now I realize that b4 wasn't a threat, but c3 also took away his pressure against my pawn on c2 with the queen and rook battery. I need to continue to be aggressive to create counterplay before he has time to coordinate an attack against my king. e5 is a strong move, I think, because I'm taking advantage of the pinned pawn on d6. Let's hope I'm right, right? You always have to be careful calling your own move strong. But now I will happily take here, get rid of this bishop on d6. I could have taken with the pawn and gained a tempo on his bishop on e7. Maybe I have queen e6 check to follow, who knows. But I like this move, and I like this immediate move that follows because I have just won a couple pawns. And you know what they say, a pawn is a pawn, no matter where you live. I will continue to play aggressive moves. I have a minute. My opponent has 45 seconds. Let's hope that I can maintain that time advantage down the stretch here. The uh, rating separation only 100 points, which is saying something here because there's uh, a lot of strong players here on the chess.com server. And so the fact that this is a pretty closely contested game means it's an exciting one. And as I said, he's also an international master, a ranked 
a titled player. I, I'm bringing the rooks to be doubled again on the d-file so that maybe I can take on e7 and then um, play rook to d7. Okay, he decides he doesn't even want to allow that. He's going to trade on d6, but I'll, I'll happily take with the e-pawn and try to drive this puppy home. It's called promotion, baby girl. That's what I'm going to do is push that pawn and turn her into a queenie poo. All right, well, he sort of self-pins this rook on c6 to the queen on a8, so now I'll open up the queen's line so that I can happily either trade queens or take advantage of the threat of rook e8 check, which is the other thing I was threatening. He decides, ooh, that would have been a really bad decision. He decides he can run his king out into the middle of the board. We'll see if he can live to tail the tail now, won't we? Uh, not sure he can. And for the record, I'm also threatening to just take the rook on d8. And that, as they say, is Chekalina Lashlamba. And looks like my opponent resigned before even giving me the pleasure of ending the game. Well, that was fun. And what we can do now is, is back up quickly as we do in these live sessions and take a quick look at it. Okay, so I started with the move e4, and, and we quickly got a Sicilian. Knight to c6 being a move board that can be played potentially for a Sveshnikov Sicilian style, uh, sometimes with an accelerated dragon, which would need to be played the move before with g6 to bring the bishop to g7. But in this case, he used it to transpose into a classical Sicilian, which is pretty typical as well, and a perfectly playable system for black. The English attack structure I was referring to is this pawn chain here, which allows me to be aggressive on the king side because one, one pawn supports another, right? In this case, white usually has to balance, you know, playing some prophylactic moves on the, on the queen side to make sure my king stays safe, and at the same time, advancing on the king side as quickly as I can for an attack. And so bishop e7 usually creates potential discovery threats, so white retreats the bishop, which also clears the way for the pawn. And the rest of the moves here were, were pretty typical. This, this trade on d4 and this move e5 is a very common transition in this uh, Shevaningen pawn structure here which is, which is the, uh, here is a rouser uh, or a classical Sicilian. Trading and making this transition to free up the square for the bishop is a typical one, but it's also positionally risky because it opens up access to the d5 square, just as I did in the game, taking advantage of that. I realize now that there was no reason for me to be patient with the move king b1. I probably should have just put this knight on d5 immediately, uh, taking away the square for the queen. If he takes it, I can take with both the pawn and the queen probably and be okay. Maybe queen takes, actually not, because he would get this g5 pawn. So I had to be a little bit careful, but I like white's chances positionally in these lines. I'm very comfortable with this English attack. I think the position was pretty unclear at this point, but when my opponent didn't trade off his d6 pawn for the g5 pawn, for example, if he went for some variation like this, even if he loses the d6 pawn and gets castled, he might be in better shape here without that weakness, and I'm not sure that I have enough pieces to really generate an attack. So my thought was maybe he should have taken on g5, but he didn't. I was happy to defend it. f5 was a good move, and maybe now I get a little bit impatient going after the d-pawn instead of uh, trying to take advantage or, or, or take some defensive measures against my weak pawn. Something like h5 would have done the job and then maybe even created some attacking chances before I came over here. So that could have been a little bit better, but I think white still has lots of compensation here. I didn't want to take here because he'll take, and if I take, he gets two rooks for the queen, which I think is probably a little bit better for him there. And so I decided to go for this sort of compensation for the pawn, and he immediately blundered the pawn back. Now white has got to be happy, material is equal, and I actually have a much better chance of continuing to expose this weak d6 pawn as I did. And eventually, here the material advantage is really just out of control, and that led to a mating net that was uh, a ton of fun to finish off. And so that was it. That was today's uh, YouTube installment here on behalf of chess.com. This is International Master Danny Wrench, and I will see you around.